Join me in welcoming Sucheta Kamath, the founder and chief executive officer, XQ LLC. So by show of hands, how many of you here know at least one self-blind person? None of you? Some of you? Great. Once, there was a baby mosquito who ran to the mommy mosquito and said, Mommy, Mommy, I'm ready for my first flight. She was intrigued, he was a little too young, but his enthusiasm was infectious. So she said, sure, honey. A Few minutes later, he comes back and he said, Mommy, it was one of the best days of my life. And she said, really, how, how so? He says, every place I went, every single person clapped like this. <laughs> this is the plight of a self-blind person. Un unlike the mosquitoes, humans do not have that plight because we have a very secure prefrontal system that allows us to take a look at ourselves and manage ourselves. So this self-awareness and something called executive function allows us to unlock the realities of the self. So what is executive function, you ask? It is a set of mental skills that allow us to manage our goals, our actions, our behaviors, our attitudes, and our emotions through passage of time. This is what allows us to achieve our goals and reach the destination of the future self. Executive function secures a strong relationship between the current self and the future self. Research shows there are three core components of executive function. Inhibition, working memory, and mental flexibility. Now, interesting thing about that, popularly, we call inhibition self-control or attention control. What you're doing right now, I hope, not texting, but listening to me. This is one particular ability I like to describe as mind's fly swatter. It allows you to ignore information that's irrelevant and pay attention to information that matters. This ability, when in action, uh, really allows us to stay centered, focused, and optimized. And this is why multitasking is a myth. The second core component of executive function is working memory. I like to describe this as mind's mental bowl. This is where mixing of things happens. This is the place where you hold on to information while you're comparing, contrasting, taking decisions, taking the current information into consideration, comparing it to your past knowledge, and you are carefully coming to conclusions. Working memory can be disrupted by distractibility and interruptions. Working memory is one of the ways we stay, veer away from the goals because we are thinking about something in the past. One of the most powerful places working memory shows up is in the place called prospective memory. This is our ability to remember to remember and remember you forget. This is precisely what has brought you here today to be here on time. So reminding yourself to remember to remember is a very critical executive function skill. The third, my favorite, is the cognitive flexibility. This is, I like to call it, is mind's sliding doors. This is, the, this is a particular skill we use to shift our mindsets flexibly, go from one idea to another, take a perspective of the other. Most importantly, this particular ability allows you to let go your rigidity and fixatedness. Any stubborn people you know? <laughs> they lack the mental flexibility. Mental flexibility, when in action, actually allows you to come to the most beautiful creations or solving solutions of not just your current self, but of the future self, and if you're generous enough, allows you to think about others and solve social problems. Now, it is not that your executive function is always at its best. We on a daily basis, you run into faux pas, glitches, but sometimes they can be epic fails. So a morning self can be very, very on top of their executive function, and by the time it's nighttime, it's wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Have you done some impulsive shopping at night, or it's just me? <laughs> so let's take an example when it doesn't work well.
I hope your laughter has some empathy for that man. <laughs> so certainly, making a mistake is inherent human quality. It's your executive function that, however, leads to learning from that mistake and taking some steps to prevent future repetition of such, such mistakes. And you know what the key ingredient is? Reflection, self-reflection. That requires pausing, inhibition, thinking about the alternatives, working memory, and flexibly advising self from the perspective of the other to do better next time. Now, the unfortunate thing about this, particularly those who never heard the term executive function until today, this is not a commonsensical word, or neither the idea is commonsensical. I like to describe executive function as the iceberg, because there's a lot that doesn't meet the the eye. And the problem with that is we often describe this as commonsensical skills or soft skills. And it's a terrible ju uh, justice because it implies they will emerge naturally or some are gifted with it and some are just losers. And that's not true. <laughs> so what happens is in a day-to-day -day life when somebody is not competent, somebody who doesn't show up on time, somebody's inconsistent, somebody just doesn't do, is not reliable, we think they are intentionally doing this or there's something wrong with them. But what if it's their executive function? And what if this executive function will not change simply be by you giving advice to them? How many of you do 360 interviews? Or how many of you give feedback, right? The premise of that feedback is you change you based on me telling you what you need to change. <laughs> this will never work because the insight is not self-driven. Now, as you can imagine, the implication of this in education is tremendous. You should be deeply concerned because we are not teaching executive function intentionally, specifically, and categorically to every child. Most important thing about executive function, the importance and value of executive function is only evident in absence of executive function. A child who doesn't pay attention, doesn't do his work, doesn't turn things in, doesn't remember to remember, doesn't stop interrupting the teacher or the classmates, is a child in trouble. But the story of executive function, as you know, does not show up in, in the grades. It shows up in the report card as comments or in teacher-parent conferences where teacher says, you know what, Ethan is a bright child. The problem with Ethan is he doesn't pay attention, he doesn't sit still, he doesn't stop talking, he, do he gets bored easily, he gets frustrated easily. Guess what? Ethan is struggling with executive function. Now, the research predicts that Ethan's life's trajectory is going to be in trouble because of executive function. How do we know? Terry Moffitt and her colleagues did a study in, that they published in 2011 where they followed 1,000 children over a period of not five, not 10, not 20, 32 years. And guess what they found? At the time of high school graduation, every child with greatest self-control and strongest executive function did not get in trouble by taking impulsive decisions, avoided teenage pregnancies, and did not drop out of school. But that was not at all enough. At the 32-year mark, what they found, that people with highest self-control had better jobs, higher income, better relationships, stronger, um, a better health, and most importantly, they stayed away from trouble. Now, why should we care? You ask me to innovate an idea, and I, here I am proposing that we should teach executive function intentionally, categorically, and systematically to every child, and not wait for that prefrontal system to mature at age what? 30. We can't afford it. So, how do you do it? I have a solution. I have done this myself. I have spent 20 years of my life dedicated to executive function training for children, adolescents, and adults. I have taken that knowledge and experience and translated it into a, a curriculum, a software. Now, that's not what it is alone. It is a roadmap for teaching children how to learn to learn about self. Imagine a child getting a profile of their executive function, which shows them their weaknesses, their strengths, and trains them how to use their weaknesses, their strengths to compensate for their weaknesses intentionally on a weekly basis. That's what I propose. And when it's done well, you can hear the child describe their own insight with great awareness. I learned that everybody has weaknesses and everybody's not perfect. 
but we're all different and unique so we all don't have the same differences and weaknesses. It's okay to make mistakes. You take deep breaths. It's okay. uh, I learned how to ask for help more if I needed it. So, dear leaders, are you ready to join me to make a change? Are we here to revolutionize something in education? Are you all deeply concerned about third, gra third grade dropout or failure? Well, don't pay attention to that, become flexible, become more cognitively and prospectively more fluid. And what do we need? We need to innovate ourselves. So one, first step is A for advocacy. Join me in advocating that every child in every school must gain this experience intentionally, uh, that executive function should be taught. B, build skills. They should be part of your conversation with your children, with your colleagues, and at work, at home, and in society. And C, let's coach every child. Can you learn to play piano without touching the piano? No. Can you sing so that you will learn piano? No. Why are we teaching math so that a child learns to manage, ma not math, but manage project? Project management is a skill that needs to be taught very, very effortfully. So thank you for this opportunity and make sure you know that executive function matters and self-blindness is only resulting from lack of self-directed attention. Thank you.